Okay, good morning, good evening, good whatever time it is for you right now when you're watching this broadcast live or recorded. My name's Jim Jacobson, like it says up in the corner, and you're watching Grockett's OG TV, the GMAT edition. We're going through the 12th edition to the guide to the test. We're finishing up the data sufficiency section today, and I think we're just going to stop. Um, so today might be a short broadcast, um, you know, depending on how long it takes us to get through these last few problems. Uh, last time, some of those problems took me longer to explain than I thought that they would, and so I just want to allow for enough time, um, rather than over-promising and planning on getting through 10 data sufficiency and like 10 reading comprehension or something, we'll just stick with this and then pick up the uh, reading comprehension next time. So, um, like I said, last time, I think we, we left off with question number 164. So we, it is time to move on to question 165, where we can start there. So uh, still on page 288, that's the data sufficiency section, the end of the data sufficiency section um, in the 12th edition to the guide. And question number 165. And on the assumption that you haven't watched one of these broadcasts before, which I know may be kind of a large assumption since... Um, you know, uh, this is kind of a strange place to come in the middle at the very end of a data sufficiency section, but maybe you just wanted to hear the answer to one of the particular questions I'm talking about today. I always write down, down the side here um, that answer choice A is statement 1 is sufficient on its own, B is 2 is sufficient on its own, C, they are sufficient together but individually insufficient, D is that either one is sufficient, and E is that neither one is sufficient even in conjunction. And so this 1, 2, 10 acronym is a way to, it's kind of a shorthand reminder of what each answer choice stands for. And I personally write down 1, 2, 10 rather than A, B, C, D, E when I'm doing uh, data sufficiency on GMAT. And it's not like I sit around doing the GMAT often, but that was just something that I learned when I was studying and um, figured I'd pass it on to you. Okay. So, uh, question number 165. If x is an integer, is 9 to the x plus 9 to the negative x equal to b? Is 9 to the x plus? Yes, plus. Plus 9 to the negative x equal to b. So, just remember that negative exponents, you know, um, x to the a, you know, and then you have, if you have x to the negative a, that's the same thing as 1 over x to the a. Negative exponents are not negative numbers, and hopefully you know that by now. Um, although, uh, actually, I suppose uh, negative ex exponents can be negative numbers if the base itself is a negative number. So, you know, for example, um, negative one-half to the, you know, negative two or something would be uh, one over negative one-half well, that wouldn't be a negative number. I should pick an odd exponent. Anyway, you get the idea. So, um, is 9 to the x plus 9 to the negative x equal to b? So we're going to need information about x and b in order to answer that question, because without those, we don't have anything. Okay. Statement number one, we have 3 to the x plus 3 to the negative x is equal to... The square root of b plus 2. And so our first instinct here is to be, is I think to get rid of the radical sign. Um, these things just get in the way for almost everything. The only time you don't do that is um, a lot of times when you have reduced something down to like, you know, three times the square root of 2 or something, uh, sometimes you'll leave those there, but when you have uh, variable expressions under the radical sign, you're, you're almost always going to remove it. So we need to square both sides. So 3x plus 3 to the negative x squared equals, and of course the square root of b plus 2 quantity squared is just going to reverse the radical sign. Um, let's get that on the, um, now we can leave it the way it is. Anyway, um, because these, even though these are two exponents with the same base, they are being added together, and there aren't really special rules for exponents like that. So um, we actually just have to use FOIL. And um, so, you know, 3 to the x times 3 to the x gives us 3 to the 2x. Remember, when you multiply, uh, so if you have x to the a times x to the b, that equals x to the a plus b. So if it were, you know, 
x to the a times x to the a, that equals x to the 2a, or x to the a plus a. So uh, first one is 3 to the 2x. Um, and I guess the other, <laughs> sorry, I keep getting these uh, properties of like binomials and things and exponents over on the side here. But um, just remember when you have x plus y quantity squared, that equals x squared plus 2xy plus y squared. This is one that's worth committing to memory in addition to this guy. Well, really this guy and this guy here. Um, and because uh, at, at times you will just see things that are this and you need to factor them to this or you need to convert one to the other. And so having that in your mind is pretty useful. Um, uh, so the second term in our expression is 2 times 2xy, which in this case will be 2 times uh, 3 to the x uh, times, come on, there we go, times 3 to the negative x and uh, plus 3 to the negative 2x equals b plus 2. We've undone the radical sign on the left-hand side. Um, and remember, same base, when you multiply two exponents to the same base, you add those exponents together. So in the middle here, 3 to the x times 3 to the minus x is the same as 3 to the x plus minus x which is 0, you know, x plus negative x. So we have 3 to the 2x plus 2 times 3 to the 0 plus 3 to the negative 2x equals b plus 2. Um, oh, okay, anyway. So um, 3 to the 0, anything to the 0 power is 1. So we have... 3 to the 2x plus 2 plus 3 to the minus 2x equals b plus 2. And here we can subtract 2 from both sides. We have 3 to the 2x plus 3 to the minus 2x equals b. And so this is looking a lot like the problem that um, we have, that what the actual statement is asking. So um, at this point, we realize that, remember, when you have exponents, one more rule of exponents, then I'm going to have to erase all this to make room for statement number two. Um, or maybe I won't. Anyway, uh, just remember that you know if you have x to the a raised to the b power, that is uh, x to the a times b. So we can reverse that, and that's what we're going to do in this case. Um, 3 to the 2x is the same thing as 3 squared to the x power, and... Um, this is the same thing as 3 to the negative 2 to the x power. Or th we could do 3 to the 2 to the negative x power, which would be more useful for us. So 3 squared is 9, so that's 9 to the x. And again, 3 squared to the negative x would be 9 to the negative x equals b. So statement 1 is sufficient to tell us, yes, uh, 9 to the x plus 9 to the negative x equals b. We can cross off answer choice B, as well as answer choices C and E, which required that statement to be uh, insufficient. Whew. Yeah, no kidding, right? Okay, so statement two, though, uh, we have an easier time with. Um, statement two tells us that x is greater than zero. As nice as that is, uh, we don't have B, and so we would have no way of determining sufficiency here. So um, statement two, insufficient. So it's not choice D, it is in fact choice A. So a lot of work for statement two, uh, for statement one, and not a lot of work for statement two. So still page 288, question number 166. If n is a positive integer, is one-tenth to the quantity times the n power less than 0 0.01? So n is greater than 0, is one-tenth to the n less than 0 0.01?
a fine question. It's worth remembering then, um, just remember that uh, in order for one-tenth to be less than 0 0.01, um, that would be a larger value for n. The larger the value for n is, the smaller um, one-tenth to that power becomes because the fractions become increasingly small. So just remember, for example, um, one-tenth to the first power equals 0.1, and one-tenth to the second power equals 0.01, and then one-tenth to the third power equals 0 0.001. So um, clearly what this is asking is, is n um, greater than 2, basically? Because if n is equal to 2, then no, 1 tenth to the second power is not less than 0.01. It's equal. Um, if, it is, if n is greater than 2, then this number here, 0 0.001, is less than 0 0.01. So let's see what we have. Statement 1 tells us that n is greater than 2. Well, that's exactly what we were hoping for. Um, in terms of sufficiency, that tells us that n is at least 3, which means that 1 tenth to the n power is small, is at least, it's less than or equal to 0 0.001. So from there, we can, uh, statement 1 is sufficient. We can cross off b, c, and e. Statement 2. One tenth to the uh, n minus one is less than zero point one point one. Yes. Okay. So this one's a little bit trickier. Um, our our pre-thinking doesn't get us quite where we want to go, so we have to do a little bit of math. Um, and so. One thing we can do is, of course, first off, we want to simplify this so that they're in the same terms. Uh, point 0.1 is the same thing as one tenth, and so then we're at you know one tenth to the n minus one, and one tenth is the same thing as ten to the negative one, one over ten to the one. So ten to the negative one raised to the n minus one is less than. Uh, and then this is also 10 to the negative 1 power. So now we have all of our bases in the same, our bases are the same, none of them are fractions or decimals, and we can now work the magic of exponents. Um, it's not really magic, but this type of operation is actually why exponents were developed. There is shorthand notation for certain types of operations. So um, this is the same thing, so when we raise um, powers, two powers, we multiply them all out. So this is the same thing as 10 to the negative 1 times n minus 1 um, is less than 10 to the minus 1. And since these have the same base, um, we now know that um, we can just use just the exponents. We can do negative 1 times n minus 1 is less than negative 1. Multiply only the left-hand side of the equation out, simplify that a little bit. We end up with um, negative n plus 1 is less than negative 1. And um, add 1 to both sides, or excuse me, subtract 1 to both sides, we get negative n is less than negative 2, which means in turn, divide by um, negative 1, which reverses the direction of the inequality, n is greater than 2 tells us the exact same thing eventually that we learned from statement 1, which was also sufficient. It tells us that n is at least 3 and therefore 1 tenth to that power is at most 0 0.001. Each statement is sufficient on its own, so it's answer choice D. Still page 288. Question 167. If n is a positive integer, what is the tens digit of n? So we don't really know how many digits there are in n right now, um, but we don't really need to. We just know that, uh, you know, the tens digit, let's just say it's a four digit number, a, b, c, d, e. We need the tens digit.
So each of these is a different digit of the number. Okay, so, uh, and so without knowing anything about n, we're not going to be able to determine sufficiency. So let's find out more. Um, statement 1 tells us the hundreds digit of 10 times n is 6. So if we were multiply, to multiply this number up here by 10, we would get a, b, well, ugh, sorry, should erase. Um, 10n equals a, b, c, d, e, 0, because we multiplied the whole thing times 0. Um, and the tens digit, or excuse me, the hundreds digit is 6. So it's actually a, b, c, 6, e, 0. And so if we were to divide both sides by 10, we would get n equals a, b, c, uh, 6, <laughs> e, which tells us that the tens digit of n is 6. Because, you know, when you divide by 10, you move the decimal place 1 to the left. So that puts the 6 that we determined from the original statement in the tens place um, of n. So statement 1 is sufficient. And we can cross off b, c, and e. Statement 2, the tens digit of n plus 1 is 7. So this one's harder to represent using my n equals a, b, c, d, e. What this, uh, and basically we can just kind of reason our way to the conclusion here. Um, n plus 1 means we're adding, you know, 1 to the units digit. So um, all that really matters are the last two digits of n, um, which are d and e, according to my little scheme here. So what this means is, so if the, n, if, if the tens digit of n plus 1 is 7, that means that either um, the last two digits are 69, adding 1 puts this up to 70, and it allows for a range of numbers, 69, 70, 71, 72, 73, all the way up to 78. We can't go up to 79 because then n plus 1 would equal, would make the tens digit 8. But the issue here is, well, ev even though all of these would have n's tens digit as 7, there is one value for which statement 2 is still true um, where, the, where the tens digit is 6. And so since the answer depends on which answer we choose, statement 2 cannot be sufficient. So, you know, n could equal, you know, a, b, c, 6, 9, or a, b, c, you know, 7, 5. In both cases, n plus 1, the tens digit is 7, but since the answer differs, I just tried to put it another way in case what I was saying before didn't make sense. Um, anyway, since the answer is it depends, statement 2 is insufficient. It is not answer choice D, it is answer choice A. Statement 1 on its own is the sufficient one. Two eighty eight, number one sixty eight. What is the value of two T plus T minus X quantity divided by the quantity T minus X? A fine question. Two T plus T minus X over t minus x equals who knows. Now one thing we notice right away is that there is a similar um, portion of the numerator and the denominator. We can simplify this a little bit. So we could say that this is the same thing as, um, because they have a common denominator, this is 2t over t minus x plus t minus x over t minus x. Oops. Minus. So really this is asking us about 2t over t minus x plus 1. And we're not sure yet which of these is going to end up being useful, but some kind of simplification is generally to your advantage. Anyway, let's take a look at the statements. Statement 1 tells us that uh, 
2t over t minus x equals 3. Well, so this is a case where that simplification really does come in handy. That allows us to substitute this value in for where we have 2t over t minus x here. So this is just 3 plus 1 equals 4. So statement 1 is totally sufficient. Um, we can cross off b, uh, c, and e because all of those require statement 1 to be insufficient. Let's see what statement 2 gives us. Statement 2 tells us that t minus x equals 5. Well, what this tells us is even in our simplified form, we end up with um, 2t over 5 plus 1 equals something. Or, you know, we could even simplify it 2 fifths t plus 1 equals, we don't know, but we don't have a value for t, and no substitution or no additional uh, information allows us to get there. So uh, statement two, while um, it does give us some information, it doesn't give us enough information, so statement two is insufficient. So it's not D, it is answer choice A. Again, statement one is sufficient. Number 169, 288, number 169. <laughs> Is n an integer? A fine question. And this is, this is, of course, one where we can do absolutely no figuring before we get to the statements. You know, there's, there's just no information whatsoever. Okay, so statement one tells us that n squared is an integer. And, you know, at, at first glance, this is somewhat tempting. You know, we could imagine that n equals, say, 3 or negative 3. Um, but just because something squared is an integer doesn't mean that the thing itself is an integer. The easiest thing to think of and this is true for other questions of this type where they give you something raised to a uh, positive integer power um, saying that that's an integer is just imagine that n itself is a square root. So we could say n equals the square root of 3. n squared is going to equal 3, but n itself is not an integer. So because the answer is sometimes yes, sometimes no, depending on what we choose for our value of n, um, uh, statement one is going to be insufficient, so it's not A and it's not D. Statement two, on the other hand, we have uh, the square root of n is an integer. So if the square root of n is an integer, um, that must mean itself that uh, that it tells us that. Um, Let's see, how do, I, how do I put this in case this isn't um, super clear? Um, the square root of n is an integer, which means that n itself equaled um, some number which was itself an integer because this is the square root of n. So let's say x equals the square root of n. Um, n is uh, some number times itself, and each of these is an integer because it's the same number. So an integer times an integer is always an integer. There is no way to multiply one integer times another an integer and not get an integer when you multiply it. That's one of the properties of integers. So um, if the square root of n is an integer, then n itself is an integer, and statement two is sufficient. Answer choice B and not C or E is the correct one. All the rest of these are going to be on page 288, number 170. If n is a positive integer, is n cubed minus n divisible by 4? So n is greater than... Don't do that. There we go. Um, n is a positive integer. Um, is n cubed minus n, well, I'll write it out. 
Is it divisible by 4? I don't know. We can, of course, factor out n cubed um, minus n. That's the same thing. So uh, we're not sure what we'll need here. That's the same thing as n times n squared minus 1, which you know could end up being happy ha happy for us. We could also could, em could end up happening for us too. Um, this is the same thing as n times n plus 1 times n minus 1. So we'll see. Statement 1. n equals 2k plus 1 where k is an integer. Right. Well, what this does tell us is that um, n itself is an odd number. Oh, so something else that we can figure out from the stuff that we have first. So over here, this information here might look familiar to us. We have n, n plus 1, and n minus 1. From previous problems, this may look familiar to us. This is actually um, a series of consecutive integers. exclamation point. Namely, um, we have n minus 1 as the product of three consecutive integers, n itself, and then one more than n. So the question is, is it divisible by 4? Let's go back over here. So 2k plus 1, uh, k itself is an integer. 2 times any integer is an even number. So n equals an even number plus 1. So n is an odd number. What this means though then, because these are consecutive um, integers, you know, if we have n minus 1, n, and n plus 1, is that since they're consecutive, if n is odd, n plus 1 is even, and n minus 1, the number before it, is also even. So um, n cubed minus n is an even number times an odd number times an even number. What this also means then is that any even number is two times some other number. And obviously in the cases of n minus 1 and n plus 1, they're not the same number that it's multiplied by, but there are two factors of 2 in, um, so now we're imagining that this is the big product of all three of these. Because this has two factors of 2, uh, there is a factor of 4 in there. So um, Whatever n cubed minus n is, it is divisible by 4 because it has two even numbers as its factors. So statement 1 is sufficient, and it's sufficient to tell us, yes, n cubed minus n is divisible by 4. So it's not going to be b, c, or e. And I'm going to get rid of this 4 to make a little room for statement 2. Statement 2 um, n squared plus n is divisible by 6. And we already know we're a little bit in trouble here because um, while 6 does itself have one of the factors of 2 in it, we can't be sure of what's going on with the rest of the numbers. Um, so, you know, of course, we can factor out. So um, n squared plus n, looking over here, that's this product right here. I'll use a different color. This is n squared plus n right here. And then it's being multiplied times um, whatever um, n minus 1 is. And so just knowing that it's divisible by 6, we have two numbers. We, it, so this is the product of n and the number 1 greater than n. So just because it's divisible by 6 does not necessarily mean that it's divisible by 4 when we multiply it times the one remaining number. Um, a good example, so um, if we have uh, 5 times 6, uh, that equals, so that, that's our n squared plus n, which is also n times n plus 1. That equals 30. And then remember, we have to add in the number that's before the other two, 4 times 5 times 6 equals um, 120, which is divisible by 4. 
But if we just go up even one, and if we say you know six times seven, that equals 42, but then we have to multiply the additional number, five times six times seven, and that equals 210, that is not divisible by four as well. So even though both of these are divisible by six, they're not both divisible by four. They're both divisible by two, you know, because we do have one even number in there, but they're not both divisible by four. So this one's a yes, this one's a no, and when you have sometimes yes, sometimes no, the answer is insufficient. So it is not D, it is answer choice A. Two eighty-eight. In the home stretch, the final column of data sufficiency questions, question number 171. What is the tens digit of positive integer x? Tens digit of x, where x is a positive integer. So we need to know what x is or find out more information about x in order to have sufficiency. Statement one, x divided by 100 has a remainder of 30. Um, and so at first that's maybe a little bit hard to get your mind around, but just co come up with the easiest example that you can come up with of a number that when you divide by 100 you end up with a remainder of 30. Let's say 130. <laughs> so you know this divided by 100 is one remainder 30. And you can also uh, come up with other numbers too. Basically the remainder is always going to be 30 if you do 230 or 330. So this one ends up being 1 remainder 30 when you divide by 100. This one is 2 remainder 30. This is 3 remainder 30. And you can basically go on and on infinitely. The tens digit is always going to be 30 when you divide a multiple of 100 that has 30 as the last two digits. So this means that the tens digit is going to be three, no matter what. So statement one is definitely sufficient. We can cross off B, C, and E. Statement two, oh, I probably should have written, this is X divided by 100 um, equals some number remainder 30. Statement two, X divided by 110 has a remainder of 30. So X divided by 110 equals some number remainder 30. So again, it, it, it helps to start off by thinking of the easiest one you can think of. So um, 140 is going to be one remainder 30. But what's the next one gonna be? Um, 240 is not going to, you know, so if we just tried to replace it, 240 divided by 110, um, it's not going to be uh, remainder 30. Um, Oh wait, did I do this? Yeah, I did this wrong. This is 220, sorry. It's actually two remainder 20 if we do 240. So the next number actually has to be one higher. 250 is two remainder 30. And then it actually goes on from there. We have to do 360 to get three remainder 30. And so because we have to change the tens digit every time to keep the remainder of 30, um, we can't. We don't have a consistent answer for what the for what the question is, which is what is the tens digit of x because it changes depending on the hundreds digit. Statement two is insufficient. So it's not answer choice D. It is answer choice A. Just as a to make this clear, two forty didn't work because it has a remainder of twenty. Two eighty-eight, number one seventy-two. Okay. Um, if x, y, and z are positive integers, is x minus y odd? X greater than zero, y greater than zero, z greater than zero, is x minus y odd? So in order to answer this question, we need to know what x minus y is or some more information about x and y. Statement one tells us that x, 
x equals z squared. Potentially valuable, but there's no y in this one. And so in order to figure that out, we still, you know, we don't have sufficiency. There's no y. So statement one is insufficient. It's not a or d. Statement two, y equals z minus one quantity squared. And of course, there's no x here. Even when, even when we multiply all of this out, um, you know, y equals um, z squared minus 2z plus 1. Still no x, so statement 2 is insufficient. It's not statement 2 or uh, alone. So now we have, all that's left is looking at the 2 in conjunction, which we actually haven't had in a while, um, not since last broadcast, actually. So looking at the two together, we do have a value for x and we do have a value for y. Let's see what happens when we do x minus y. So x here equals z squared. And then we have a value for y, and when we multiply it out, that also has a z squared, which is good news because it helps us get rid of a z. So it's minus z squared minus 2z plus 1. Um, and then we can, um, we should probably rewrite that out, z squared minus z squared plus 2z uh, minus 1. Oh, sorry, this equals x minus y. And so from there, um, the two z squareds uh, cancel each other out, so we get x minus y equals 2z minus 1. And of course we don't need the actual value of x minus y when we have something like this because we know that, it, so z we know is an integer, you know we found that out from the original question, so two times any integer is an even number, and then minus 1, or really minus any odd number, it's going to equal an odd number. So x minus y equals odd. So the two statements together are sufficient to tell us yes. It is answer choice C. Second last question, the penultimate question. So if arc PQR above is a semicircle, what is the length of diameter PR? Yeah, it's one of those. All right. That's about as good as it's going to get for a semicircle. And we have a triangle within it. And then we have this. And we have this and P Q R U R two um, and then we have this and this. This is A and this is B. I think that's everything. Yes. So we need the length of P R. P R equals who knows what. So, right. Now there is some prefiguring that we can do here. Um, one of the things is that since uh, triangle PQR is um, in a semicircle, by definition, when we uh, have our two points here on the circle, when all three points are on the circle like this, um, uh, angle PQR, since it's a semicircle, PQR is a right triangle. Um, which means that whatever PR is, um, it's also the hypotenuse of a right triangle PQR. So actually I should probably write this down. PQR equals a right triangle. What that means for us is that it's susceptible to the Pythagorean theorem, which means that um, PR squared, which is a plus b, so PR squared is going to equal the sum of the squares of the other two sides, namely PQ squared 
plus PR squared. No, QR, QR squared. And we also know that PR squared is A plus B. So PR squared is A plus B quantity squared equals uh, PQ squared plus QR squared. We also know some things about Q and R. Um, so keep in mind that these are both definitely right angles and right triangles. And so QR and PQ are both the hypotenuses of their own right triangles. So um, doing the Pythagorean theorem for just triangle PQ, uh, uh, I'm trying to think of what point to call this, we'll call this point X. So PQX is its own right triangle. So um, where am I gonna put that? I'll put that, I'll put it over here. <laughs> So um, PQ is the hypotenuse, and that equals A squared plus, and then the other side of the triangle we actually know, which is 2 squared. So um, PQ squared equals um, A squared plus 4. And we can do the same thing with the other triangle. We know that uh, QR squared is going to equal basically B squared plus 4. Just kind of saved it, saved myself a step there. So um, we can actually plug those values into our equation over here. A plus B quantity squared equals. Um, I mean, you know, I'm doing all this because I cheated and looked ahead. Um, each of the answer choices give us give us a value for A and for B. So um, while it's tempting to, I should probably just write those statements in. A equals four to B equals 1. And so of course the immediate answer is to say well A plus B equals PR, the two statements together are sufficient. What we need to see is whether one of these statements on its own, because of all this wizardry with right triangles, to see whether one of these is enough to get us all the way to the right answer just with A or just with B. So that's what we're doing. So I'm doing this problem in a slightly unorthodox way. Um, so we know at the so at worst the correct answer is C. We can actually already cross off um, the neither answer because um, we know that, and we can also cross off um, almost certainly A and B because these both give us the same type of information. So it's either the two of them together or each individually. So we know that back to, so back to our regularly scheduled program here of uh, triangle wizardry. Um, we have a value for PQ and we have a value for QR. We plug those in um, here and here respectively. So we have A plus B quantity squared equals A squared plus 4 plus B squared plus 4. And, you know, we may as well multiply both sides out. So the left side equals a squared plus 2ab plus b squared equals a squared plus b squared plus 8. And I like where this is going because where this gets us is um, we can subtract a squared and b squared from both sides. I'll just rewrite that. So a squared plus b squared plus 2ab equals a squared plus b squared plus 8. Subtract this from both sides, we get 2ab equals 8. Um, therefore, ab equals 4. Now, of course, that alone is not enough for us to answer the question, but this is before we even got to the statements. If we get either a or b, we can solve for the other one, add the two together, and we will have the length of pr. So that's where we look at our statements, and statement 1 tells us that a equals 4. So if a, b equals 4, and a equals 4, 4b four equals 4, b equals 1, statement 1 is sufficient. We can do the same thing over here, a, b equals 4, um, a times 1 equals 4, so therefore a equals 4. So a and b are 4 and 1, the diameter of the semicircle is 5, a plus b, and both statements, either statement is sufficient on its own because of some massive triangle wizardry and substitution. 
I think on this one, this really is a question uh, where the only way you could get this one right is, I think, to recognize that um, PQR, angle PQR is a right angle, um, or the, you know, the, the largest angle of a uh, right triangle. Without that, I think any other person would just choose um, the two statements together and probably get it wrong. So every once in a while the GMAT does throw one like that at you where there's just no other way other than just kind of seeing the magical solution. And if this isn't magical, I don't know what is. Anyway, second to last, oh no, last problem. Okay, page 288, question number 174. Marsh's bucket can hold a maximum of how many liters of water? So um, we'll make B equal her bucket's capacity. B is for bucket. And we don't know anything about the, the capacity of the bucket, so we're actually just gonna have to you know get to the statements and see what we get. So statement one, tells us the bucket currently contains nine liters of water. So we know that the bucket's capacity is greater than or equal to nine. You know, um, uh, buckets can't hold more water than there is space. Uh, but knowing that it's, we need the actual value, it's a value question, so having a range of values is not sufficient. Greater than or equal to nine, not sufficient. So it's not A and it's not D. Statement two, um, if three liters of water are added to the bucket when it is half full of water, the amount of water in the bucket will increase by one third. So we're adding three liters to the bucket when it's half full. So let's turn this into algebra. Um, one half B, so the bucket is half full and we're adding three liters. That is equal um, to the amount, in the, the amount of water in the bucket, which is half full, um, it will increase by one third. So that's the same thing as multiplying it times four thirds. That's one third more than three thirds. So that's, uh, you know, a 33 and one third percent increase. So one half B plus three, if we multiply four thirds times one half, that equals four sixths, sixths B which in turn um, equals two thirds B. So one half B plus three equals two thirds B. And two thirds is more than one half. So let's subtract one half B from each side. So um, two thirds B minus one half B equals three. And we have to convert it into sixths to, you know, to have a common denominator for the two fractions. So it's four sixths b minus uh, three sixths b equals three. So one sixth of b is three, therefore b equals 18. So statement two on its own was sufficient. We can cross off answer choices c and e, which required both of the statements to be insufficient on their own. b is the right answer. So it looks like we're done a little bit early on this occasion. Um, let me just uh, check really quickly to, I'm just gonna double check the, uh, the uh, Facebook page for the video to see if anybody has commented about this particular, hopefully this won't get all feedbacky. Let me turn my volume down. So I'm checking my, uh, oh wow, that's so weird. So are any of these today? Nope, looks like no, no comments today. Um, okay, yeah, interesting. Oh wait, let's see, I should double check the, the last page. Oh yeah, that's all old stuff, okay. Okay, well, um, just know that if I get done early on any given day, I'm actually going to, uh, you know, check the Facebook comments to see if anybody has said anything. Um, and uh, so, you know, 
send in your comments. I can't guarantee I'll get to them by the end of the session, but I think I'll just make a habit of just checking uh, at the last uh, the last bit right before um, you know right before I, I I log off just to see if anybody had any questions about anything. So um, have a good um, day slash evening slash whatever it is that's going on for you watching this live or uh, re previously recorded. My name is Jim Jacobson, like it says on the screen right over here. Doo -doo -doo. And um, tomorrow we start with the reading comprehension or, you know, 30 seconds from now when you start up the new video. So uh, see you next time.